blog I wanted to show you. We talked before about flight lines and when I was in Fiji, of all places, there wasn't a question about this. They had a lot of LiDAR flown and I hadn't really looked at it all that much. So I used the opportunity to have a look at their LiDAR when to my dismay I found out that that's all the LiDAR. And here you see, you know, again, why Last Tools has this kind of boring interface because when you work with a lot of data, that's really all you need uh, for looking at. I realized when I did a last overlap check that this was a very unsatisfying last overlap check because it shows you the flight line overlap. But I was looking at that, wait a minute, you're saying me the, the entire town was one flight line? That couldn't be. So what has happened, the company delivered the data, didn't properly populate the flight line information in the tiles. And when you don't populate it properly, you basically prevent the customer from checking the flight line alignment. So, good idea, good idea. <laughs> so when I was there, I had some free time. Um, so I sat down and, I comp and that's when I created the recover flight line options. Uh, because I looked at the density, this is looking at the density, how many points per square meter map to a false color, and you can nicely see the flight lines there. So it's not one flight line. I know it's multiple flight lines. Um, and actually it looks really choppy. If you look at how crazy this, it looks really, the density goes up and down and up and down and left and right and more dense, less dense, more dense, less dense. The reason is this was flown with a helicopter. So choppy actually makes sense. Chop, chop. Uh, it's difficult to get equipment to and from Fiji. It's very far away. Uh, so they rented a helicopter locally and just brought the LiDAR system. And uh, so I created a new tool uh, in last overlap, this recover flight lines option. And with this recover flight lines option, I was able to completely recover all the flight lines based on the GPS timestamps. And now it looks more like you would expect to. And then, uh, and then I was able to create the difference image. So after all this time of recovering the flight lines, I took some time off to recover myself. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is how last tools development sometimes happens. I go somewhere, uh, I've, I identify a need, and I'm interested in cracking that. And instead of lounging on the beautiful beach, I write some software to uh, recover the flight lines. And there was still some time for the beach at the end. I think I'm out of uh, material. I mean, I'm not out of material, don't get me wrong. Um, I'm not really out of material. And actually, while we sort of winding it down, we could, you could, have a little bit more fun with batch scripts, which we haven't done much. I just showed you a few because you have a whole bunch on your laptop now. Uh, if you go to area one, for example, you have these batch scripts. Now, I don't want you to look at the batch scripts. I just want you to run them. Um, maybe run the quality check batch script. Just double click it. And then all this work you've been doing, it's all happening automatically because that's the beauty of batch scripting. It's a quality check for whichever scripts are in this um, are in this folder, and it's doing all the work. You don't have to do nothing but wait for the result. Ah, and it's already ready. Suddenly, there's a folder here called quality. So we open the folder and we look quickly through the quality checks. There's a density image. There's a difference image. There's the overlap image. There's another density image. Okay, and uh, similarly, there are two more scripts, one to prepare the LiDAR and one to produce products. Oh, let's prepare the LiDAR. Let's not look into the details. I wrote the details like a few months ago, but the details don't change very much, you know. Uh, um, so I'm uh, just running last ground on this small project. And 
So this will happen sort of in the background and I'll just show you a bit of the results and how quickly you can get them. Uh, so feel free to ask questions if you have any. Now the color code's always the same. Yeah, they are always the same. Uh, right now, you can change them by giving some command line option, which I almost never have to, because up to five overlaps have kind of nicely color coded, you know, blue, agua, yellow, orange, and red. That's usually sufficient. If you have much more overlap, I think then it gets confusing anyways. I don't know what, what kind of maximum overlap people may have sometimes. Uh, you have a lot more than five flight lines overlapping? Mm -hmm. Maybe in sort of a point where they, you know, a crossing point, but. Yeah, yeah, in the corner maybe you could have, but it would be very rare. And also you could infer it from the surrounding colors that this color should really be more red than red. It was maybe seven in a small area, but if you see two red areas merge, you know, from di different directions, the color should, I guess, change one more time. But the crucial part is sort of one, two, three, I would say. Okay. The difference pictures always go from blue to red. Yeah. With blue and red meaning the same thing. Uh, there's no significance in one being blue, one being red, except vertical, uh, horizontal shifts can be noted by interesting constellations of blue and red. If a mountain on one side is red and on the other side is blue, you you have a shift that is a, uh, di um, perpendicular to the separation of the blue and the red area. Because if you move a mountain over, then one area gets higher, the other gets lower. So you get one blue here, one red here, and perpendicular to it, that's what the sh where the shift has happened. Um, okay, now that the, this has run, I'm uh, running the next script, raster products. I'm putting it into the background and look what I did here. So I calculated the ground. Okay, that worked fine. But oh my God, what did I have here? Plus, 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 there were some clouds in the sky. So I run a denoising. In this case, I use last height to denoise. Last height can also be used to denoise. I say everything that's higher than 100 meters above the ground, remove it or classify it something. Uh, if I know I don't have any skyscrapers, I'm not in, uh, in Dubai and chop off the big skyscraper there or there are very tall trees. So here now I fixed uh, the noise, no more points in the clouds. And the next thing I do, um, I classified it I mean, I classified already the ground, now I classify the, the rest. And this is a very beautiful data set with a fairly high density. So I get very beautiful classifications. So it's a you know, very quick way of quality checking, just going through like this. Everything looks really nice. Here's my forest. Okay, in the meantime, I have started uh, the derivative generation. It's still running. Um, I'm looking at the DTM here. Now all the buildings are gone. Don't I have a DSM somewhere? No, a DSM is just being produced. It's still zero kilobyte. DSM is done. So here's a DSM, DTM, DSM, DTM. It's a different, different light direction. This was actually done for, uh, this is a um, LIDAR for archeological purposes. And the things people are interested in are these little bumps. These are some archaeological artifacts. Um, so that's why we shaded it with different, with different uh, shadings. So you, in different shadings, you see them differently. See?
And finally, I used the nice data set uh, to also extract the buildings. And voila, now I have a nice building raster. And all this happened while I was just talking because I have a script and I put it once together and when I want to do something similar, I don't start from scratch. I take that script, I modify a few lines here and there and I run it again. Um, because LiDAR processing pipelines are inherently similar. And what I started with, you know, I started with these five little strips that just generated all this, these unclassified, you know, five strips that formed one tile. Um, by the way, in the meantime, we have um, another data set here. I just created a, a DTM, a DSM. It's a forested area and I ground classified it. So if I look at only the ground points and I retriangulate it and calculate away the forest, what happens? Uh, I suddenly can see things I couldn't see before. There are some things in the forest. A gigantic dinosaur walked through this area here. <laughs> Again, this is an archaeological data set. And what they were looking for is these little holes here, I think, bumps like this. Or well, there's a bump like this here, and there's a bump like this here. Um, one thing, if you sometimes see this in your, in your um, hill shading, this here, you see how it's a little rippled here? This is an overlap of two flight lines, and the two flight lines aren't perfectly matching. And then uh, you get what I in German call a, sh a Spargelfeld. You know, uh, Spargel is this vegetable that grows in the ground, asparagus, and you build these little areas to grow it. And so the Spargelfeld looks like up and down and up and down, and that's how it looks like. This is a, it sometimes looks more drastic than it is in the, in the hill shade in the triangulated hill shade. In the meantime, I created all these, um, all these raster products also for this scene. And here you see before, after. And we again shaded it in different shadings. And uh, did I create isocontours? Yes, I also created isocontours. with last two ISO. And that's batch scripting. That took only 20 minutes of the two days uh, because it was all written once and then I copied it and into the other folder and changed the name and changed uh, step size and that was it. And now I have just to double click it to get all these products whenever I need them. Thank you for coming. All right, and if you want to follow new developments, you know, you can always go to the <laughs> Facebook page or the rapidlasso.com or some people are on Twitter. <laughs>